KPZ equation. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks Ivan and Evgeny for organizing this year's seminar. And yeah, I'll be talking about law of iterated logarithm for the KPC equation. And this is a joint work with Promit Ghoshal from MIT. So let me describe what KPC equation is. So KPC equation is kind of like the most popular model for modeling random gray interfaces. And it is essentially given by a stochastic partial differential equation, this equation one. Uh, the problem with this equation is this because of this presence of nonlinearity, this equation is ill posed. So, one way to tackle this problem is one consider stochastic heat equation with multiplicative noise, equation two. And if you take logarithm of the equation two, you actually get equation one formally. So, one way to define a solution is just solve the second equation, take logarithm, and say it is the solution of KPC equation. This is known as the Hofkoll solution. And since I'm dealing with a partial differential equation, I need to specify what is my initial data. So I'll be dealing with Dirac initial data, which is given by this. And one can show that ZTX is always strictly positive for this initial data. So taking logarithm is well defined. Okay, so this is my setup. And if you are unfamiliar with KPZ equations, so this slide is kind of hard to digest. So let me just briefly a disclaimer kind of thing. So think of HDX is just like a space time stochastic process. So this is a cartoon, like fixing time T, you can think about like it's a random function which is evolving in time. So I am also having a NW here to denote the fact that I'm considering direct delta initial data and which is also known as narrow wedge initial data. So whatever I have defined in first slide ensures that this process is, is a well-defined thing and it has a unique law. So you can essentially forget whatever I have defined in for first slide. Okay, so let me uh, state some, some of the interesting properties of this process. So uh, we have something known as spatial stationarity. So fixing a time t, if you add an appropriate parabola, it becomes stationary. So roughly speaking on each time slice, your process looks like an inverted parabola. So that's why I have drawn it in this manner. And so we have spatial stationarity and it was proven like a decade ago in a seminal paper by Amir Corwin and Questel. The distribution of HT zero has a very explicit expression. And not only that, if you take time T tends to infinity, it has Tracy Widom GV fluctuations. So this is Tracy Widom GV distribution. It comes from the random matrix theory. And this is the kind of scaling a, you need to add a t over 12 and divide by t, u, t1 to the power one third. So in this talk, my central interesting object is this math frac HT. I will be talking about this object. More specifically, I'm interested in how the peaks and the values of HT behave. So what do I mean by that? I will get into it. So before moving on, uh, let me also say like in this paper, they also deal with something as time t tends to zero, this we have actually Gaussian fluctuation. You need a different kind of rescaling. This is given by something known as short time scaling, which is I denote it as math frag gt. So right now it is not required, but we will come back to it later. So let us just focus on math frag hd. Uh, okay, so let us try to see what happens for the Brownian motion. So I have simulated some Brownian motion. So we have fluctuations, uh, as we all know, it is of the order t to the power one half. And if we are interested in like what happens to the limb sup or limb inf, we all know that law of iterated logarithm actually gives you an envelope. So this envelope is essentially given by two root two, two log log t. And it is symmetric. We have same thing on the other side as well. So this is what log, law of iterated logarithm tells you, right? Okay, so this happens for the Brownian motion. So what about my process HT? So I will call it as KPZ temporal process. In case of temporal process, the fluctuations are of much smaller order. It is of t to the power one third. And well, the, um, about the envelope, one thing is noticeable 
like it tries to go upward more than downward. Like the limbs are much, like the difference is much smaller compared to the upper one. So if you try to construct an envelope, it is kind of guessable that this envelope is kind of asymmetric, not similar, contrary to the Brownian motion. So I will try to see what are these envelopes actually. Okay. So I will, in the talk, I will compare with Brownian motion again and again. So let us do some analogies with Brownian motion. So I have Brownian motion in one hand and the temporal process of KPZ in one hand. So we know that Brownian motion has a normal Gaussian fluctuation, whereas Tracy Widom has limit, where HT process has limiting Tracy Widom fluctuations. If you recall the law of iterative logarithm from Brownian motion, it has this form. So here I have written square root of two as half raised to the power minus half. So this red halves, if you go back to the proof, this red halves comes essentially because the Gaussian tail has a quadratic exponent. So the two actually reverse to one half. And this green half, it comes because it has a prefactor of half sitting here. Well, if, if you believe this, now you can ask what about the tails of the Tracy-Widom distribution? So what happens, the upper tail of the Tracy-Widom distribution has essentially x to the power three over two kind of decay, and it has a prefactor of four third. So if we have a law of iterated logarithm, you can guess what should be it. So our law of iterated logarithm looks like this. So it grows like in the rate of log log t to the power two third. And the exact constant is actually given by the uh, tail of the Tracy Widom distribution. So let me pause for a five second so that you can get a sense of what we are trying to do. Okay, so this is how the limb sub behaves. It has a growth of log log t to the power two third. And we can also talk about the limb inf. Well, in case of Brownian motion, since Gaussian distribution is symmetric, we get the same thing. However, for the Tracy Widom distribution, it is highly asymmetric. The exponent is actually cubic. It is much more unlikely to go downwards in case of Tracy Widom. So the limb inf is actually you can guess what should be the limit. The limit actually has the rate of log log t to the power one third. And again, the exact constant is dictated by the tails of the Tracy Widom distribution. So the limit has a much lower growth compared to the limb soup. And that's why we have the asymmetry as seen by the simulations. And we also have the exact constants. Okay. Um, so let me briefly describe what is the proof. So as with the case of the classical Brownian motion law of iterative logarithm, you have essentially two parts. One needs modulus of continuity one hand and an, an independent structure on one hand, and then you hit it with borel cantilly lemmas, you will get law of iterative logarithm. So the essential idea is to get a sense of our process HD. So what we were essentially able to show that these are the two meta theorems kind of, the height difference is actually related to the short time scaling that I showed you like three, four slides ago. If the time difference is very small and this meta theorem actually leads to a very concrete modulus of continuity. Whereas if you take the increments, the increments also behave independent, approximately independent if the time difference is very large. This actually gives you the second kind of independent structure. Okay, one also needs to quantify what do I mean by approximately independent, but uh, I cannot do this in this short talk. So let me now briefly say like, what are the tools that we used in proving this kind of things? Well, since it is related to the short time tails, we first need to have some idea about the short time tail behavior. So we developed some, some short time tail estimates. Also, since our law of iterative logarithm has the exact constant, we need to rely on long time tail estimates as well from these papers. And also we need to improve some of them. Also, unlike Brownian motion, the increments are very complicated. The, the relationship between HT1 and HT2 is not very simple as Brownian motion. One is to go through this heavy machinery called Brownian Gibbs property for KPZ line ensemble, and also for like convolution formula for stochastic heat equation. 
to get to see how these things are related. And this will essentially give you some kind of tail bounds for this quantities. Okay, so yeah, that's what I can say in brief in this brief time. And let me end with some kind of comments and questions. So once you develop law of iterated logarithm, you can ask about what we do we have, can we prove about Hausdorff dimension? So our results actually extend up to the Hausdorff dimension. And instead of temporal process, you can ask, well, fixing time, what happens when we take X tends to infinity spatial process? So this was proven in this paper for a wide class of that data. They have fractional logarithm. Um, so you can also ask, instead of taking time t tends to infinity, what happens if we take time t tends to zero? So it is proven for flat initial data. They have host of dimension result. You can also ask about other initial data like uh, yeah, flat initial data or whatever for the temporal side. Also, you can ask about other models in KPZ universality. So for exponential LPP, this result was proven by these two papers. So they have this log log t to the power two third and one third scaling, but they do not have the exact constant because they do not have a good uh, control over the tails, the exact prefactors. And also it is proven in this paper by Packet and offers Zetuni for the eigenvalue, largest eigenvalue for the GV matrix. So they have a law of fractional logarithm. And for the lim soup case, they have the exact constant. So this is the literature and I guess it's a good time to stop. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Shan. Do you have the, the, the references, the three letter acronyms, or do you have a page that you say what, what they mean? Or uh, KX17, right? This is by Davar Koshnevishan, um, Imin Zhao and Kim. This is the same reference that was highlighted by Karsten. Okay. What was the ZHO nineteen paper? Uh, this is um, by Zong from Stanford. He is a student. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I guess he developed some estimates for tail behavior, like okay. fine. I understand. Okay. Other questions for Shayan? We have a or two. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, is there a hope for a functional version of this low iterated logarithm of like Strassen type? You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, a functional version? Yeah, so when you rescale not just the the endpoints, you know, you look at the, like, you know, in the winner process case, you look not just at the position at time t, but at the entire trajectory. And you can also scale it by um, by the you know by the law by the denominator in the law of the iterate logarithm the entire thing and then there are limiting trajectories and they are sort of you know they form sort of the skeleton of this of this space uh, so the limiting space is the Strassen ball which is the unit ball in the Cameron Martin space it would be interesting to see what this sort of this the analog of that is here I see. Yeah, that's a very good question. Probably one needs to understand more deeply about this temporal process to get an idea about this functional behavior. I mean, usually, you know, in, in more, you know, in more classical settings, it's mm -hmm. just it's just a matter of, um, you know, some additional tedious work. But uh, usually if you have the usual law of traded logarithm, then you also have the functional law. So but but honestly, I mean, nevertheless, I mean, I don't I don't have an immediate um, sort of conjecture what the limiting, um, you know, the version of the Strassen's ball ball is. But it will be really curious, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, thank you. I'm gonna stop.